He that knows the motions of the heavens with Galileo, or the cosmography of the moon with Hevelius, or whatever else with the greatest artist, he is nothing if he knows them merely for the talk, but if he knows them for value, shall profit infinitely. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your host, here in Guildford, Matthew Russell. Oh, yeah, baby, Hevelius. That's right. That was a quote by Johann Hevelius, who was a astronomer and politician from the 17th century, whose birthday is today. He's the founder of lunar topography, apparently, and describes 10 new constellations, of seven of which are still used by astronomers today. This is a bit of a quick episode. Um, I've been struggling to get the podcast out this week due to work commitments, but don't worry, normal podcast service will resume shortly. Uh, But I thought I would give you all a really awesome interview, or the second half of an interview, part four of the Alan Bond interviews. Um, I had originally posted this on the Patreon page, but I thought it probably should have the bigger audience of the podcast because it's very, very interesting. So if you've heard it before on Patreon, it's definitely worth listening to again because it's extraordinary. So without any further adieu, Ecoutai... The Interplanetary podcast putting the ace back into space can i get really nerdy yeah because <laughs> the uh, the um I've, I've been reading a book quite recently called ignition which is a which is a book that got republished it was and it's all about lots of different types of uh, rocket fuels basically the, the 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 hunt for the perfect rocket fuel and i know that you spent your time when you worked for the Ministry of Defence, you were spending a lot of time, your own personal time, on computer time that you'd managed to uh, correct yeah. uh, to, to get uh, working on on looking at basically your own personal research into ignition yes. types yeah. and, and and launcher types. Yeah. Is 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 there any like really great insights that you've got from that? Other than finding out you couldn't have single stage to walk. So there's a, there's an old phrase about horses for courses and. Um, I think Elon Musk chose pretty much the the ideal propellants for a space launcher. Liquid oxygen and kerosene is really quite hard to beat. There's a, a little bit of performance gain if you go to methane, and uh, <clears throat> clearly, uh, uh, believe it or not, even engineers have fashion, and uh, <laughs> methane is is kind of in fashion. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, but lox kerosene is, is really quite a good energetic propellant. If you really need to push the performance, then lox hydrogen uh, for space applications is, is pretty much unbeatable. If it comes to other applications, for, for example, military applications with liquid propellants, then storability and uh, toxicity and things like that uh, become important. But um, the use of storables like uh, oxides of nitrogen, nitrogen tetroxide, together with amine fuels, um, they, they seem to be really the most packageable and best you can actually do. There's one oxidizer that keeps sort of uh, rattling around in the attic, and that's the question of hydrogen peroxide, uh, high, HTP high test peroxide. And in the UK, um, we had a vast background in that. We built up a vast background, and that background came because HTP is notionally storable. Mm. And uh, back in those days, people were interested in two things. One was to get large aircraft with, with inadequate jet engines off the ground. So the V-bombers, for example, uh, when they were got their first uh, generation of jet engines. Uh, but also the Russians were coming and we wanted interceptor fighters that we could get to altitude very quickly. So mixed power plant fighters sort of came into view. Mm. And also um, some brave soul through the cameras, through mushroom clouds, taking samples of radioactive material. And we wanted them in and out of those clouds as quick as possible, where additional rocket thrust came in. 
and an ideal oxidizer that you could sort of put in, have it standing around for a long time. Hydrogen peroxide filled that bill uh, very well. Now, uh, my poor old colleague John Scott Scott, no longer with us, was a tremendous advocate of hydrogen peroxide. He'd, he'd been distilling sort of uh, hair blonding hydrogen peroxide since he was a kid yeah. and uh, used to get it up to about 40% or so. Mm. And uh, I know that a lot of his time his skin was bleach white <laughs> oh uh, from his earlier. He, he loved hydrogen peroxide. It was without a doubt his favorite uh, propellant. But John was very interested in pumps and uh, you could get very low suction pressure uh, at the inlet to a pump on hydrogen peroxide. Uh, but to get it to burn properly, you needed a catalyst pack. And in the UK, we actually were very successful in developing sort of silver gauze catalyst packs to do that. For today's work, um, clearly there's a lot of interest in the UK in a national launcher. Mm. And where we're heading again, just touching on the sort of Brexit note, there's, there's really quite a, a strong pressure that a national launcher should be politically independent of anybody else mm. so that uh, we don't want a propellant that somebody could refuse to sell us. We no longer produce HTP in this country. So it's not because of performance or safety or anything like that. I simply feel that from a political point of view, our national launcher, if we get one, uh, should use liquid oxygen rather than uh, HDP for no other reason particularly than strategically liquid oxygen is extremely easy to come by. Mm. So there are lots of other uh, aspects of propellants. There are some very interesting propellants from a chemistry point of view, especially, for example, if you want to have very high density propellants. So uh, the... Uh, uh, fluorochloro uh, uh, oxidizers uh, are extremely interesting from a chemical point of view. There's also um, the possibility of propellants on Mars. Mm. So if you're looking at Martian missions, for example, what's Mars got? Well, it's got an atmosphere of carbon dioxide. And if you put a nuclear... Uh, uh, factory down on the surface of Mars, which the, the chemistry of that looks as though that could be done fairly straightforward. Uh, you could manufacture carbon monoxide and liquid oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere. Um, I know that, uh, for example, Robert Zubrin is very keen to take uh, hydrogen with him to, to make methane mm. or use water off the Martian surface to make methane. Whereas uh, I feel if we're, for the first few generations, if we're going to send people to Mars, what we really need is the propellant to simply come to you uh, <laughs> in the Martian atmosphere. And uh, carbon monoxide and uh, oxygen are really quite adequate. You can actually do single stage to Martian orbit uh, with rockets on those propellants. You've got to work on the engine technology, but that's something that we've developed over the years. So pre-burner cycle engines, um, the combustion temperature is quite high and the uh, heat fluxes. But I think that uh, we now know enough with modern manufacturing to make combustion chambers that would do that. Mm. So again, when I say horses for courses, um, using uh, carbon dioxide out of the Martian atmosphere, I think is, is a very exciting option. Mm. Looking further into the future, strictly on propellants, but not chemical propellants, if we're going to use electric propulsion ultimately to uh, potter around the solar system, so um, this is probably going to be uh, some very high specific power, nuclear power plant, then to me, the ideal propellant for that is argon. Um, it's not ideal from an ionization point of view, <clears throat> but uh, argon is pretty ubiquitous around the solar system. And uh, I think looking at it, it's relatively easy to extract from pretty much anywhere that you finish up. Uh, Mars particularly has got a lot of argon. So if you're gonna use electric propulsion uh, uh, to potter around the solar system, then uh, I think that argon as a propellant is, is very, very good. Mm. That's a pretty comprehensive answer. I've not really heard the carbon dioxide one before. <clears> and, <throat> and yeah, that's because um, because a lot of, like you said, the methane one has become ex, ex, like really fashionable. Yes. Europe, Prometheus, uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos are all methane. Yeah, so based. If, you, if you set a, 
If you put a fairly small nuclear reactor on the Martian surface with a chemical plant separating out carbon monoxide and oxygen, then the European Space Agency particularly has done a lot of work on uh, solid oxide fuel cells for this very reason, that you can use carbon monoxide and oxygen in fuel cells. And uh, they've got to operate at very high temperature, um, but uh, you can power all your land surface vehicles using electrical uh, fuel cells from the same propellant source. So to me, breaking down the Martian atmosphere into carbon monoxide and oxygen is, is very good. You can go a stage further to uh, uh, carbon suboxide, um, but carbon suboxide has got a, a nasty habit of spontaneously polymerizing, uh, which produces a nice big explosion. But, right. uh, um, <laughs> but carbon monoxide, carbon yeah. monoxide itself uh, can be made to detonate, but uh, nonetheless, it's a cryogenic mild cryogenic, bit like liquid oxygen. So it's all the technology that we know. It's not as cryogenic as hydrogen mm. and uh, relatively easy to uh, handle. And uh, I mean, one, one technology that you, you actually mentioned on the last podcast was the bipropellant engine that, mm -hmm. that, that you'd, you'd kind of worked on. And, and uh, are you surprised that that's not become more of a thing? Because it, it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, to have a, a kerosene beginning and a... And a and, a, and switch to so, liquid hydrogen later on. The Russians uh, looked at that uh, quite extensively. And uh, although the overall propellant loading that you need increases, um, the uh, actual structural fraction of the vehicle goes down. And it turns out that uh, depending on what it is that you're trying to do, there can be an optimum in that. Uh, but uh, overall, the advantages that it gives relative to air breathing, for example, mm. in many respects, although these other things were things that I'd investigated, in, including uh, engines with four propellants, uh, looking at uh, oxygen, kerosene, nitrogen tetroxide and uh, hydrogen, um, <clears throat> you can win marginal uh, sort of things. But the thing that really transforms it is when you decide to use the atmosphere as the uh, sort of uh, part of the chemical source and reaction mass uh, up to Mach 5. And that, that really transforms everything. So mm. all those other things then dropped off my personal radar uh, because I'm fairly convinced that that is the right route forward until we start looking at uh, much more advanced things which are not yet with us but which yeah. one can see uh, coming along. Right. <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, so talking about the advanced things, is it, is this uh, uh, does, does this lead nicely onto what the sort of thing that you're uh, at doing at the moment? Yeah. So uh, I've I've now left all the chemical propulsion in other people's capable hands. There, uh, uh, there's so many people now developing rocket engines. You can get on the internet. You can download all of the necessary software and programs, and. Uh, I've got a young friend in the British Interplanetary Society. Um, he's, he's only 14 years old and he's uh, designing rocket engines, even studying nuclear missions and so on. Um, that information is readily available. <clears throat> but it seems to me that uh, we're not at the end of the line yet. One of the things that's uh, excited engineers since the days of Faraday is the possibility of using electric and magnetic fields to push uh, fluids around using the Lorentz force, colloquially J cross B. Um, but of course, the fluid has got to be electrically conducting to do that. So it works with liquid metals like mercury. And in fact, uh, um, magneto hydrodynamic pumps are used in sort of sodium cooled nuclear reactors and things like that. Uh, I've got no moving parts and so on. And if you could wave a magic wand and make the atmosphere electrically conducting, then it would transform things beyond recognition. So one of the areas that I'm looking at is, is very much uh, a what-if exercise of uh, can I find some way of making the atmosphere conducting just locally around the vehicle 
I only need sufficient electrons and ions uh, to lurk around long enough whilst the airflow is passing over the vehicle um, so that I can uh, have a magnetic field orthogonal to the aerodynamic surfaces on the vehicle, um, an electric field parallel to those surfaces, so that that uh, produces a force which pulls the air over the aerodynamic surfaces, generating lift in pretty much the, the conventional way, uh, but generating thrust by pushing the air backwards by this uh, magnetohydrodynamic uh, effect. And that's what I'm looking at. So the calculations are very easy to do. Uh, provided that you can have your magic wand that says I I can persuade electrons to sort of lurk around long enough. Yeah. I can offer them some incentive not to go and lurk, then search out the iron that they originally came off and recombine. Mm. So one of the things I'm currently doing is uh, I've got some people interested in putting some funding into uh, a basic uh, plasma physics experiment, which would involve uh, making air conducting at low temperature. You can make air conducting if you raise its temperature high enough, but that involves horrendous amounts of power. Mm. Um, whereas uh, if you can uh, make the electrons and the air cold, then you can delay the recombination long enough um, that uh, uh, you, can, you can get the necessary effect. So uh, at this point in time, I've got some institutions that are interested in having a look at doing the actual plasma physics and uh, uh, some people interested in putting a bit of money into that. It builds on some very preliminary work that Tony Martin and myself did back in the 1970s uh, when we both worked for the Atomic Energy Authority at Cullum on nuclear fusion. And we, in that case, what we did, we cheated. We used a tank of salt water uh, for the uh, conducting liquid and demonstrated the principle uh, but now trying to take that a step further and, and do it actually for live in the real atmosphere, which is a much more exciting challenge. Yeah. I mean, could you do it with submarines then? <clears throat> and indeed, people have built uh, uh, submarines, uh, the Japanese particularly, um, that do work on this principle. And of course... Uh, there is the famous Sean Connery film, The Hunt for Red October, um, which... Uh, the caterpillar drive that he talks about in that um, is actually a linear uh, motor of the sort that Eric Lathwaite introduced into engineering. Um, it's not actually the sort that I'm looking at, which has got active uh, electrodes emitting electrons and reabsorbing them on another electrode um, in the hunt for Red October, which is a quite credible propulsion mm. system. Uh, that's just using a travelling electromagnetic wave uh, to generate both the electric and the magnetic fields and uh, exercise a thrust on the water. And people have built systems like that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's quite funny, the hunt for Red October... It's, uh, my old acoustics lecturer was uh, enamoured by it because it was so accurate on the acoustics front as well. Oh, it? right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well the, electromag the electromagnetic engines on that would work well. The only trouble is if you manage to sort of put it into the mouth of a river where you've got no salt water, you're buggered. But, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, with, uh, just to change the subject slightly, with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 coming up, what were you doing at the time of Apollo 11? I mean, you in terms of your memories of 20th, 21st of July, 1969. Yeah, I'd been up to uh, see my parents. I lived in Coventry uh, with uh, um, my wife and uh, we'd been up to see my parents in Derbyshire and uh, were driving back to Coventry that night and uh, um, in the early hours of the uh, Sunday morning, actually, uh, sort of Sunday morning, Monday morning, Monday morning, we actually sort of uh, watched that on the television. I got very depressed about that because um, in the uh, earlier part of 1969, I'd been out in Australia. Uh, I, I was in charge of the performance of uh, the RZ-2 rocket engines on the F-8 round of uh, Blue Streak, <clears throat> which was the first stage of the Europa 2 vehicle. And uh, we launched the, that particular vehicle, as I recall it, on the 3rd of July and um, beautiful performance uh, from the British stage, the French stage, at last worked fantastic, as it had done on F7. 
and then the German stage self-destructed uh, seven seconds into ignition. And so I came back from Australia having seen yet again a European effort even to get a small vehicle to operate. And then a couple of weeks later, the Americans were all over the moon. And, uh, I went into a serious sort of depression for several weeks after that, uh, just seeing the uh, technological gap that was growing in uh, the space technology between uh, Europe and the Americans. I'm pleased to say that our European colleagues have closed that gap quite considerably. Um, and the Americans, meanwhile, have forgotten how they did it. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah. quite so scary. Did you have any direct contact with the Apollo program, anyone on the program? or No, not as such. Um, Val Cleaver, who was the head of the rocket department, uh, was a personal friend of Von Braun. And uh, Val Cleaver was a networker. He knew everybody in uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, U.S. institutions, many of whom were Germans. Uh, Val had been involved very much in debriefing German rocket engineers after uh, World War II and uh, had built up a lot of close personal uh, friendships uh, out of that. So via Val Cleaver had uh, some contact, particularly on Apollo 13, um, when uh, clearly... The Americans had got a, a lot of problems uh, on their hands and were appealing pretty much around the world to see what could be done. I spent a lot of, there were quite a few of us out of the rocket uh, department at Rolls-Royce, uh, spent time in Val Cleaver's office, sort of, find, Val was getting first-hand information of what was happening pretty much, you know, hour by hour. And uh, people were trying to uh, see whether there was anything we could do. There was nothing. I mean, at the end of it, we were just bystanders like everybody else. Had a more direct involvement with the Americans when they got into trouble on the space shuttle main engines. And they ran into problems with the whirling on the hydrogen pump. And uh, Rolls-Royce had technology uh, which looked as though it could help uh, to solve that. But with the regard to the Apollo program as such, I personally had no real direct contact uh, with any of it and indeed didn't even get to see a Saturn V fly, which oh, yeah. uh, is uh, uh, one of my big failings in life. Oh, no. Did you, did you ever see a space shuttle? I saw a space shuttle go and yeah, uh, sure. that was good. <laughs> so yeah. are you um, talking of uh, fl uh, talking of lo rocket launches then? Are, <clears> you, <throat> are you looking forward to either going down to Cornwall or up to Sutherland to see a, a UK <laughs> I, launch? I haven't considered that uh, option, but... Uh, no, one of, one of the great things was that, obviously, as a kid up in Derbyshire, uh, listening to Journey into Space and uh, uh, reading Dan Dare and uh, reading all kinds of stuff on space stations and spaceships, um, back in the uh, sort of middle of the 2000s, I went off to uh, Canaveral and I saw a spaceship take off and head for a space station. And then a couple of nights later... I was outside my front door watching the ISS uh, uh, fly o over my house in the early hours of the morning. The ground track was just 100 metres uh, just outside my front door here. So from a child sort of reading about that stuff, it gave me quite a sort of uh, um, spine-tingling moment, I think is, is right, to, to recognise that I'd actually seen a spaceship take off and go to a space station and uh, I'd seen the space station go over. And it's very, very hard for me to actually uh, describe the kind of emotions I actually felt about that. I mean, we, we give things different names. I wish we could call things spaceships. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. at, at least uh, um, Branson has uh, called the, uh, <laughs> a spaceship uh, uh, yeah. two. Uh, I, they, I like I like the term spaceship, although it's rather quaint and old fashioned. Now, are, are you tempted to go on spaceship too? No, <laughs> but, uh, not because I don't uh, trust it. But um, to me, and I've uh, I've been come, I've become very close to being mugged down the BIS once before when I made this point. That, to me, the sort of uh, suborbital stuff is uh, in the trip around the lighthouse sort of uh, uh, category. Um, would I like to go orbit? Yes. I, if if somebody was prepared to pay for me to go to orbit, I'd go tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I can't afford it, but uh, I'd, I'd love to do that. 
but um, with regard to uh, experience and a few uh, uh, minutes or less than yeah. that in zero G on a straight up and down flight, that that wouldn't really uh, wouldn't cut the mustard. Of, no, no. I, I could probably get a flight on a vomit comet and uh, have a similar kind of experience for a fraction of the cost, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, actually, do you know what? I agree. There was a there was an in camera footage of Jeff Bezos's new Shepherd going up and down, and I was thinking, actually, yeah, I I think I'd be a little bit disappointed because it's all it's very similar to the kind of videos that you see anyway of <coughs> yeah. high altitude balloons. It's like it's not that much similar, not yeah. dis too dissimilar. So yeah, yeah, I, I, for for a prolonged period of zero g. That, I mean, the nearest I've got for zero G so far is just going off a diving board in the swimming pool. <laughs> um, and that lasts sort of seconds. But, <laughs> and it's very painful if you hit the water the wrong what? way. But uh, do, you, do you know much about Orbex and, and their kind of... Uh, I don't. And their... their uh... Because they're using what? They, they're using camping gas is their, is their rocket propellant. The propane. Now, yeah. propane is a very... We talked about propellants earlier. Propane flagged up very early in my career of having one exciting, interesting property, and that is that it is liquid at the same temperature as liquid oxygen. Mm. And therefore, the, uh, <clears throat> the tankish configurations that you can adopt and the insulation that you need between them uh, does bring you quite a large weight saving. And uh, I think uh, their configuration on that is very, very interesting. And there's only propane out of the hydrocarbons that can actually pull that trick off. Fortunately, propane is very readily available, uh, more, more readily available uh, than methane or butane. And uh, I think that uh, that is an interesting combination, but that's... That's only the sort of uh, rocket engineer of me uh, yeah. coming out in terms of uh, rolling in all the uh, sort of commercial and strategic aspects and so on. Um, I don't think you uh, you can really beat uh, Elon Musk's choice of good old Lox kerosene. Right. Uh, so yeah, what what what's what's the disadvantage then of, of propane? Because because yeah, that 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 can dual concentric tanking is exactly the way they went with it. Well. Uh, your, well, that that is uh, uh, a, a good configuration, and if you're going concentric tanks are good if you're going to uh, sort of pressure feed the system. There is a beautiful little German World War II anti-aircraft uh, rocket called the Typhoon, and that's the only other ve liquid propellant vehicle I know that had concentric tanks. And you arrange the diameters so that the uh, cross sections are in the ratio of the mixture of the propellants. And then you uh, use a cordite charge to pressurize it from the top. So you've got uh, a simple mechanism that stops one of the propellants splashing into the other. Mm. Um, but then both propellants recede down the rocket at the same rate. And uh, finally, there's a bit of a gurgle, it goes through the uh, injector at the end. That was a beautiful rocket. I mean, sad about the application. But uh, there, if, if you're going to pressure feed a rocket, then that is a good configuration to have. And the fact that you don't need to have insulation on the intermediate boundary wall mm. is, is really uh, good news. But um, if I'm going to ask myself, you know, cost, availability, uh, a good old uh, sort of kerosene tanker, <coughs> Blue Street ran on SO Blue. And... Uh, not Aladdin Pink, SO Blue. And uh, we, uh, I mean, it was just so readily available. Mm. The kerosene was never really an issue. Um, the only thing is, of course, it uh, turns into a wax if it gets down to the liquid oxygen temperature. Mm. You're sitting in front of an excellent <coughs> picture of Hotel. <coughs> Could you uh, go into a bit of detail about the, the various iterations of Hotel, how it developed through its... Uh, its career, if you like. In a, in a nutshell, what happened is that um, back in June 1982, I, I came up with this engine concept. And the first, because everything I'd looked at previously took off vertically, I was looking at uh, a, a vertically launched vehicle using what has since become known as the Sabre engine. Um, Bob Parkinson, meanwhile, had, uh, un unbeknown to me, had been looking at the other end of the uh, 
uh, problem of actually getting a vehicle back from orbit and trying to get a satisfactory cross range in terms of uh, uh, how what lateral distance you could fly off the orbital ground track. When Bob and I, I can't remember exactly how the conversation took place, we suddenly found that uh, uh, we'd got different parts of something that uh, looked as though there was synergy because I couldn't make the vertical uh, takeoff vehicle fit in with the uh, density profile of the atmosphere. It was pretty clear it was going to have to accelerate downrange much more rapidly than a conventional rocket does in order to feed the engines. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, we finished up with a, an idea of a horizontal takeoff vehicle powered by air breathing engines. And at that point, Bob managed to convince uh, uh, British Aerospace to look at it. And John Scott Scott managed to find a bit of cash in a Rolls Royce kitty to have a look at the engines. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, people that had been working on Concorde at Bristol got involved. And so Configuration A came into existence, which didn't use Bob's swing wing configuration, but uh, was quite clever on the wing design, which had come out of all their work on uh, Concorde, of course. So all of a sudden, we'd got a really expert team coming in. So it, it quickly went through various iterations on configuration of intakes, where the engines were located. But we'd always put the engines on the back of the vehicle, and that's where they remained through the entirety of the HOTOL project, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. So we went through configuration B, C, D, and then it broadened out within British Aerospace and involved Wharton um, with the uh, um, technology that they'd got on building battle wagons uh, up there, um, whereas the people at Bristol, were obviously their main uh, uh, supersonic experience was on Concorde. But uh, the Bristol people brought a lot of intake um, knowledge into it, Tony Wilmer and Terry Brown particularly. Um, a guy named Frank Crowfoot did the original sort of configuration of uh, HOTEL, but he dropped out of it. But after Wharton uh, got hold of it, they put quite a big team together, about 50 people, uh, supported by various departments as well. And the so-called Configuration F came out of it. Now, due to the way in which um, they had modelled it, in order to do optimization, they'd taken the pressure limits off the engine. And so the engine could operate at any pressure. And all of a sudden, Configuration F, despite the fact it was built like a brick outhouse, had got uh, a tremendous amount of propulsion on it. And I sort of sat uh, in this very same living room that we're talking in at the moment one day, and I thought, how can this be? It doesn't match up with my own modelling. And I called uh, Gerald Wilson, who was the project manager at their end, and we went through the various things. And uh, finally, it dawned that we'd taken the pressure limits off and that the engines were operating at some astronomical pressure um, in order to achieve the performance. And it was clear that Configuration F, um, whilst it was incredibly valuable, and this is really very important when you, when you come to thinking about things like Skylon. It's very important to have a central concept that you can go away and analyse all the aspects of, even though at the end of the day it doesn't all fit together. Nonetheless, you've looked at everything. So by the time it was recognised that Configuration F didn't make it, um, very, very quickly um, British Aerospace turned their computer uh, simulations around on three more or less parallel uh, looks at it. So that was configuration G, um, configuration H, which makes me smile because um, at that time there was an emeroid product called uh, Preparation H and <laughs> Configuration H became known as Preparation H. And, uh, and then Configuration J and uh, pretty much at the end of the day, all of the uh, knowledge that we'd gained got rolled into configuration J, which is the image that's on the wall behind me. <clears throat> but it was then realised that there was still a lot of shortcomings. So, for example, the shockwave from the wing fell across the intake on configuration J. But at, at least uh, it was starting to look as though it could uh, uh, produce the performance. But I mentioned earlier that we'd hung the engines on the back of all of the HOTOR configurations, and that had the undesirable effect of moving the centre of gravity well back. And then during the ascent, 
the centre of uh, uh, pressure, the centre of the aerodynamic centre, moved forward. And so the vehicle de de uh, developed a horrendous uh, pitch-up moment, 2,000 ton metres of pitch-up. And the only way to combat that was to put massive flapperons with uh, a huge hydraulic power supply to drive the flapperons. And we sort of uh, lost the uh, performance in all of those real vehicle uh, problems. <clears throat> but because we'd had a configuration to hang it all around, when the project came to a halt, unfortunately, and uh, the uh, alternative concept study group had not got round to taking on board what we were finding. So when John Scott, Scott, Richard Varvel and myself got together to review what had gone wrong, and we realised that uh, it was this CG, CP uh, sort of problem, um, that's when the configuration for Skylon came into existence. And straight away, all of the things we'd been battling on HOTEL went away. Um, what we then started doing was refining some of the structural concepts for the vehicle and so on. Skylon is very, very much the next generation of HOTEL, um, but it's a big configuration change. There was a configuration K, but that still had uh, the engine that's hung on the back of the fuselage. Um, but Skylon is really the next generation of uh, HOTEL. It's all the same technology, it's just repackaged in such a way that uh, we get rid of this centre of gravity and uh, aerodynamic centre shift problem. Mm. So the death of HOTOL was almost the birth of Skylon? It was, um, but Bob Parkinson and myself in more philosophical moments have discussed that and we're quite convinced that had um, uh, HOTOL continued into the next phase, then the Skylon configuration would have been the obvious conclusion. The, Richard, Richard Varville and myself had got sketches dating back way into the HOTEL era where we had looked at uh, putting the engines in different places, but not for the configuration reasons that eventually was the death of, uh, of HOTEL. Um, Steve Furness, who was the perform one of the performance uh, guys uh, working on HOTEL, had been warning us for two years that we'd never be able to trim the vehicle. And so it would be a natural conclusion that uh, when we got to the revision of configurations J and K, the next step would almost certainly have been, if not uh, HOTEL, uh, if, if not uh, Skylon, something very Skylon-like would have uh, come out of that. And can you talk about um, the involvement with the Russians with the Antonov 225 and how did, how did that come about? Well... I can't really talk about that because I wasn't really involved in it. Um, so Bob Parkinson. Had, had Bob Parkinson. So <clears throat> Bob Parkinson, in, in, incredibly innovative uh, guy. And uh, I mean, if you reduced him to sort of bits of balsa wood and some rubber bands, he'd find some way of getting to Mars with it. You know, it, uh, he's, he's that sort of person. He can always sort of take what he's got and come up with the best you can get out of it. And at the end of the HOTOR project, um, Rolls-Royce essentially backed out and didn't want to proceed further. And so this left uh, British Aerospace, who was still interested in looking at uh, a vehicle uh, with no engines. And uh, Eric Webb um, sort of took uh, charge of that. Um, but Bob Parkinson realised that provided you tweaked everything just enough, and if you put a uh, rocket on top of the Antonov 224, and uh, carried it to a high enough altitude before you uh, sort of chucked it off, um, then very credibly, um, especially using available Russian engine technology, you came up with something that, that really could look as though it could hack the uh, HOTOR mission. But obviously you've got an integration problem in doing that. And there's always, with any two-stage vehicle like that, do you light the rocket engines before you throw it off the vehicle um, so as that you can ensure that the engines have uh, ignited? But as a safety issue, do you want to throw it off the vehicle before you light the rocket engines? In which case, the rocket engines might not light and you just see it sort of disappear into the distance. So there were lots of issues with interim HOTEL, but um, almost certainly interim HOTEL uh, in my view, could have been made to work. 
What does make me cry is that recently I've been uh, for a different uh, investigation going through my archive and looking through all the old records and uh, HOTEL uh, was scheduled to go to orbit on its maiden flight in 1997 and uh, had it had the support during the 1980s then uh, Britain, this interesting nation, um, would have been out there sort of selling vehicles to other nations and uh, ploughing the way to orbit um, for, ten uh, for 20 years now. And uh, mm. it's, it's what we lost due to myopic vision, you know, within government. Uh, I can't blame the industries. The industries uh, had the vision. But uh, uh, clearly there's only so much investment on a project costing quite a few billions, even in 1990, we would have been talking about a £5 billion uh, programme um, spanning sort of uh, maybe 12 years. But um, it's, that's, that's what we've actually lost in terms of uh, what we could have actually had now. We would not have been watching SpaceX uh, go into orbit. Uh, we would have been watching hotels flying from all kinds of places all over the planet and we would have had a, a much more vigorous space programme with less contentious issues about what the development costs were and so on mm. than we've got now. So that's, that's what we gave away. Mm. So with, when you've got Sabre Engine, it, it, once, once the Sabre Engine has sort of passed all these kind of reviews and people suddenly go, this really is, you know, it's, it's a viable engine. Do you think the Skylon concept will suddenly reappear as a... As, I do, yes. As a, as a... <clears throat> but there may be some intermediate steps because we talked earlier about what everybody wants these days because they're risk-averse is to see things broken down into smaller, affordable steps. And uh, so what I think that we will see on the way to Skylon um, is... Uh, intermediate stages with with possibly something coming in as a rather smaller two-stage vehicle hmm. um, which uh, once that's sort of shown what can be achieved what the practical structural fractions are in particular how we've learned to handle uh, subcooled liquid hydrogen on a vehicle how you can fill it drain it operate it safely etc um, how you can abort a takeoff and get the vehicle back <clears throat> then I think that people will be uh, will reach a point where they say, "Why are we mucking about like this? Let's let's go on and and do the the full thing." Yeah. But I I do think that it's it's in the culture now that we go by these sort of faltering intermediate steps yeah. um, before we we do what we should have done in the first place and build the damn thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Uh... Maybe that's a good place to stop. We've uh, we've gone a long so time here. So unless a unless you've got a couple of questions. Questions, yeah. if that's okay. Um, a bit of history in terms of your early uh, contact with the BIS. Could you talk a bit more about that? The people you were associating with, projects you were doing at the time, when this was. Yeah. So my first contact with the BIS was actually whilst I was at grammar school. And uh, of all people, it was the English teacher there, Mr. Holt. And uh, because of poltergeist and things like that that I was doing, uh, one day he turned up uh, with a great pile of buff-covered um, BIS journals and said, I think these are more used to you than they are to me, even though I'm a member of the Interplanetary Society. And at that time, I didn't actually know a lot about the Interplanetary Society. I'd read a, a tremendous number of books by people like uh, Ken Gatland, for example. And uh, so I knew that the Society was there and existed. Um, but um, I hadn't actually done uh, anything about sort of becoming a member of it. Um, I guess I'd focus much uh, closer on my own sort of rockets experiments and uh, propellants and all of that sort of stuff because I did, did eventually finish up uh, being involved in the uh, production of 54 rockets and uh, um, uh, flying and testing them with various degrees of success. So eventually I joined Rolls-Royce and uh, uh, because of my past background, I, it was immediately found I could help with... Uh, uh, the development work that they were doing there. And so I didn't have to, un I was an apprentice, but I didn't have to undergo the normal sort of uh, apprentice training that you might expect. And uh, 
eventually at the tender age of 24 I actually finished up as the deputy under Viv Wallace in charge of the cryogenic performance office and uh, I was at a conference in Brighton with Val Cleaver which was uh, particularly about Black Arrow and I can't remember the precise date and Val Cleaver said we can't have a situation where you're not a member of the Interplanetary Society. And Val Cleaver, bless his cotton socks, paid for my first membership of the Interplanetary <laughs> Society, of the grade uh, AFBIS in those days, the uh, Associate Fellow of the British Interplanetary Society. And uh, because of the conferences that the Society was putting on and the people that I then found myself rubbing elbows with... Um, people like King Gatland. So I, I can't, I, I don't know really how to explain this. I mean, people like Val Cleaver and King Gatland, for example, um, they were people that lived on Mount Olympus in my uh, imagination. And here I was through the society, rubbing elbows with them and talking to them, not, not as a, a mere human to a god, but on an equal status, having a discussion with them, having a debate. Now, you're aware of, uh, you know, we've got this young guy in the Interplanetary Society at the moment who's 14. Which is Clarence. Yeah, it's young, <laughs> young uh, Clarence uh, Delphini. And uh, I see a lot... Clarence and myself get into a lot of uh, debates. Mm. He's got a young, bright mind, and he throws up a lot of stuff that uh, makes me think. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden, I realise that the tables are turned here, <laughs> and that uh, you know, Clarence is interacting, finding that he can interact with me on a, a, a completely equal footing, and we can have a debate. And uh, I mean, I, I can see. Obviously, naivety, but this guy's 14, so what would you expect? <laughs> and uh, so I, I tried, to, and I can see how, looking back, Ken Gatland and Val Cleaver particularly used to talk to me. We became, you know, with those two people, they became very, very close friends. And I used to swap a lot of material with Ken Gatland, particularly over nuclear propulsion. Uh, of course, uh, Ken was uh, very excited with that, um, with Val Cleaver over... Uh, what the right configuration of launch vehicles was. Uh, Val was very excited about the Mustard programme, for example, um, which I myself was less so because I could see all the big integration problems involved. Oh. All my life was all about single stage to orbit, which uh, Val was always sceptical of. It's a shame that he didn't live to see the uh, air breathing uh, engine come along. Mm. But the Interplanetary Society was, to me, a real platform where I could uh, I could meet my gods and, uh, and actually talk to them as a straightforward, plain human beings. Mm. Which, and that's where I think the strength of the society is now. That Because uh, if you go to a big conference, you can sort of obviously meet people and you can make their acquaintance, etc. But um, through the Interplanetary Society, with the meetings that they have, they're smaller... Um, you've got 50 people and mm. uh, you can actually go and be accosted uh, by people who want to ask you questions and, and meet people, uh, you know, right across the board. And mm. it, this is main function in my view. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The social function. Yeah. Sorry? The social function of it, the connection. Aspect. Yes. Well I've, well, I've always, yeah, I must admit, I've always believed in the sort of coffee shop change of the world where you look at any kind of big of big things that change in the world. It's always been a group of people that have been meeting in a coffee shop, great yes. minds that have sort of got together. And if, if you if you have a space like <coughs> Arthur C. Clarke House where Clarence can talk to Alan, then, it, then it's, it's like this amazing... The great thing about when you, when you meet people from space in somewhere like the society, there's very little by way of sort of social stratification. Mm. Um, people in the space business are really excited to talk to you about what they're working on mm. and, you know, <clears throat> willing to answer any questions, no matter how daft they might be. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's where the, the amateurs can give something to the professionals. Yes. The sounding board. Yes. Were, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, in, in the discussions with Clarence over nuclear propulsion, um, I've actually come back and I have actually run him some calculations uh, which have been interesting for me with regard to uh, uh, some of the results uh, produced. And, 
Um, I hope I'm not betraying a confidence, but Clarence at the moment is uh, looking at the impact of nuclear propulsion on Mars missions, for example. Right. And uh, so uh, I'm not on the internet as a matter of choice. So yeah. what I quite often do is find that my mobile phone has got a text on it that you have to scroll through endlessly, <laughs> stuff with numbers and uh, illustrations and so on. And then I think, oh, God, I've got to go and sort of think about this, <laughs> uh, run some calculations and uh, send them off to them. It's, it's a good interaction. Yeah. Well, funny enough, I've seen his tweets on, on, the, on, the, that, on the, that subject. I didn't realise he was talking to you about it because he, yeah. he does actually listen to the show. So. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, it, that's just one sort of extreme example of one of the older members of the society interacting with one, yeah. with, well, probably the youngest uh, sort of member of the society. Um, we used to have a cat that was a member of the society, I recall, <laughs> but <laughs> he wasn't I, so interactive. I didn't have much interaction with that. <laughs> yeah. It was rather a mono, monotone dialogue. <laughs> but. So Sorry. Yeah, but just the ability to go and interact with people working in very different sectors of the yeah. space area. Because um, as a propulsion guy, you tend to forget that there's somebody with a payload that's got to go on this thing. And yeah. They've got requirements rather than what you want to provide as a propulsion engineer. So, yeah. uh, so when you were growing up, and um, even now, as it were, who were your heroes? You know, who, who, I mean, you've mentioned Elon Musk now. But if you go back to your, your early days, who did you look up to? Who did you admire most? So, obviously, there were people like Frank Whittle and uh, Val Cleaver. They, in terms of British uh, uh, engineers, were the outstanding people. Glushko, the Russian uh, engineer, as we learned more and more about what was going in in the Russian programme, I realised what an absolutely outstanding uh, engineer but also intellect that uh, Glushko had and uh, whilst uh, stage combustion rocket engines were a bit of a novelty and uh, quite new in the West and my first interaction with that was uh, through the German work at uh, MBB on the uh, P-111 suddenly realised that the Russians had been building and flying stage combustion uh, engines from the 1950s and the standard rocket engines that they were producing for their missiles um, were stage combustion engines. Uh, to the rest of us, you know, uh, it was still rather new and novel, but the Russians were looking at uh, combustion chamber pressures and uh, engine sizes that were different by a factor of five from anything that we were looking at. So Glushko uh, uh, became uh, one of my heroes. But then somebody that came up from the outside and didn't realise until... Uh, uh, I guess the 19, uh, 1990s or, or late 1980s was Kuznetsov. So Koryolov, as I already indicated, was daggers drawn with uh, Glushko. And uh, uh, Koryolov, being the character we've already discussed, Glushko didn't want to do what Koryolov wants. So Koryolov uh, 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 went to Kuznetsov and said, I want some engines, and these are what they roughly look like. And Kuznetsov, having never built a rocket engine before, went away and came up with the uh, design of the engines for the what we now sort of see as the uh, N launcher, the N1. Um, those engines are the NK33 and the upper stage version, the NK43. Uh, they are the most incredible uh, rocket engines ever built. Uh, nothing's anywhere near them on thrust-to-weight ratio. Uh, for LOX kerosene engines, they uh, outperform anything. And the design of them is just so elegant. Um, it's quite amazing in something as complex as a rocket engine, you get an engineer to lay it out. And three different engineers will produce three different designs, and yet... All of a sudden, you'll come across somebody, and uh, my colleague Richard Varville is one of these people, who, who just has the ability to put all the things in the right place, and and you can just tell. And so, I've always uh, joked about Richard Varville that uh, uh, he is Amadeus uh, uh, to uh, 
my uh, oh, I've forgotten the uh, the mediocre guy's name now. Salieri. Salieri. <laughs> so I've always joked with Richard. He's Amadeus, and I'm Salieri when it comes to uh, actually uh, doing something because. I, I, I periodically do a bit of design and uh, I think, that's, that's pretty good. I'm really pleased with that. And I'd I say to Richard, well, and you remember that bit in the film Amadeus where Salieri has prepared the bit of music yeah. for uh, Mozart to enter. And uh, I'd say to Richard, so what do you think of this, Richard? And he'd say, oh, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. But, yeah... However, if, if you sort of move this uh, to here and you just sort of did that, he said, now that really works, doesn't it? You go, oh, bugger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why couldn't I see that? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a real exact parallel to that scene out of uh, Amadeus. And, uh, but Kuznetsov came up uh, with the NK-33 uh, engines and... They are just so elegant. It's like the Typhoon rocket that I mentioned earlier. You look at the design of that, and it is just such an elegant piece of design. You know, it's it's beautiful. Mm. You know, there's nothing else you can say about it. So those are some of my heroes. There are other people like uh, Phil Bono of Douglas with the uh, single stage to orbit concepts that uh, uh, he came up with. And of course, uh, Werner von Braun. I'm, I'm aware of the controversy surrounding his background, which uh, uh, I, my admiration for him is only of his technical abilities with regard to uh, um, his ability as an engineer to design rocket engines and mm. uh, rocket concepts. And sadly, whatever else uh, <laughs> yeah, hard, World War II <laughs> sicked upon him, yeah. um, uh, he's uh, second to nobody on that. And indeed, even today, space programmes are very, very much shaped by the vision that uh, Von Braun had, um, on which, mm. to some extent, the BIS had with its earlier studies. But if you look at the ancestry of where it's gone at the moment, Von Braun is really the uh, sort of route that he actually came through. Even poor old Robert Goddard, despite having spent donkey's years developing rocket technology, because he was so secretive, it never really uh, influenced, you know, mainstream rocket propulsion. Mm. And NASA, I think, bought out all the Goddard patents from uh, Esther Goddard in order to avoid any future uh, sort of conflicts uh, over all of that. One, uh, this is slightly uh, different question. How hard was it to convince other people about Sabre? You know, when you had the... The, the concept and uh, you're thinking about how you're going to bring this to fruition, you had to convince other people. I've, uh, I've often com compared that to getting into a barrel and rowing it up Niagara Falls. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I, I don't think I can really sort of express that. To, uh, any, any other way. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite hard. Yeah, yeah that, that sounds quite hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very uh, I'm uh, worried that we've, we've taken well, no, an awful, lot of, this, awful uh, lot of your time. We're, we're okay, yeah. and uh, you guys must be starving. But uh, there is a little cafe in the village uh, that uh, does food all day, just down near the co-op there. And there's a pub across the road. I won't join you because <laughs> I'm out for a quite sizable meal tonight. Uh, but yeah. with. Uh, I, I, I have got one question, and that's your uh, your 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 little group called Sizem yes. that, that uh, I enjoyed. Uh, have, have, is there any plans to get that together again? And, 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 and... no, I've I've still got some bits of uh, some of the rockets from those days in my archive, and uh, there's one in particular, a little rocket called Lady Elizabeth that uh, I've often considered it wouldn't be nice to rebuild because. Um, Lady Elizabeth and uh, some of the other rockets um, taught me an awful lot and also left a lot of open questions with regard to uh, no matter how carefully you do your sums, <clears throat> you take it out and fly it and it doesn't do anything like you expected it to do. Mm. And uh, Lady Elizabeth was a, a nice little research rocket. That was uh, a rocket that pulled about 400G uh, <laughs> Um, it burning time was very, very short, sort of tens of milliseconds. And uh, I, I would like to rebuild that, but I've got no plans to, uh, to pull an amateur group together. There is a very thriving amateur rocket community in this country, 
And uh, I think one of our mutual colleagues, Richard Osborne, is very much uh, involved in that. And uh, you know, that's that's really good. It's a good a good place where young enthusiastic youngsters sort of either think, well, you know, bother that for a game of soldiers, <laughs> yeah. or uh, they think this is fun. You know, how yeah. do I get to do it? Uh, and. It's those people that are, have decided they want to get into it that I'm really interested in sort of trying to help. Yeah. Uh, I personally would never try to convince somebody that uh, hadn't expressed an interest that they should take engineering and science. Yeah. But those poor lost souls that have already done it on their own, yeah. I'm very interested in sort of helping them as far as I can. Um, but um, I think it would be different in a different country, but this country we've we've already sort of said enough about, I think, with regard to that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. You, um, I've, I don't know, I just, I had just had a little question in my head, and it's just literally gone in the moment you said, <laughs> the moment you took it just slightly away from uh, uh, that. Oh, damn. Oh, well, I'll let you if you've got another one. I, no, I'm, I'm, I think I've, uh, I'm okay. So, yeah. Was that okay? Brilliant. Oh, there's some, there's some absolutely yeah, amazing yeah. stuff in there. Yeah, so that, that's, that's really cool. Um, just about covered everything possible there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm. Yeah. I'm in terms of. That's actually. I mean, I could. I could press you on that point in terms of. Yeah. I mean, how. It, it, is that your kind of underlying philosophy in terms of, of in terms of the people that you know are going to really go on and do something amazing in engineering. They're the people that have kind of found their their way to that position anyway, rather than sort of going round to schools and sort of selling the idea of all these things like yeah, STEM, so et cetera. During the 1980s, the uh, Engineering Society started a uh, an activity called Opening Windows, and I was recruited into that. This was sort of in the height of the uh, Thatcher era. And uh, I went to talk to quite a number of uh, uh, pupils, mostly in private schools. And... Um, there was one particular in Oxford, and a young uh, kid in the uh, audience there, uh, I think it turned out his brother was already an accountant or something, said to me, uh, how well paid is it then in uh, um, engineering and science? And I realised at that point that I really should not be doing this <laughs> because uh, one thing that um, was clearly... Uh, never going to happen with that people were going to get rich and wealthy and have their yacht down in the, uh, the Mediterranean and things like that by going into science and technology. And I suddenly decided that what I was doing was actually, this may sound odd, but I felt it was morally wrong to go and try to excite these young sort of fertile minds with, uh, with something that was not going to lead them to a good standard of living. Um, because of the prevailing political attitudes of the day, um, would actually lead them into a, a very, very frustrating future. And so I, I sort of asked myself, you know, why am I doing this? And then uh, I, I actually resigned from the scheme. I'd prepared, back in those days, we had VHS uh, videos mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff, and I'd actually prepared some quite good video material to try to, uh, starting in the Industrial Revolution to try to, you know, bring out the excitement of uh, what technology has done for society mm. and all of that. Uh, but I just decided that it, it wasn't right to try to uh, influence them in this way. Um, however, it's very different if somebody has already got the virus <laughs> and uh, yeah. that you uh, you then encourage them, having recognised they've got it, to actually get the best they can out of their life yeah. uh, with it. So I've already said to young Clarence, you know, uh, I'm only helping you because you're already a lost soul. I've told him this, and, uh, <laughs> that I'm quite happy to help him now yeah. that uh, he's made that transition. So it's uh, to me it's very, very difficult uh, to try to persuade somebody about science and technology. It is a good career. If It depends on your, your mm. mindset. Uh, it can be interesting, but uh, at the same time, it brings with it, particularly in this country, so much frustration all the things that you know you can do. You know, you've got your computers, and we know a vast amount about materials and uh, uh, 
CFD codes will tell you such a vast amount about what a flow field is going to do. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, you have to you have to build a piece of kit and test it and find out the flow didn't decide to do what you thought is going yeah. to do something else completely. Nowadays, you've got a lot of really good handles on that, and you know what it's capable of. But then you come to the politics and the funding, and uh, going around and trying to get somebody yeah. interested. Um, and that's when you find out that to be able to carry it off, you've got to be a first-class scientist, a superb mathematician, a outstanding orator. You've got to be a perfect financier, financier able to talk to other financiers and uh, get them to understand what you're talking about. You've got to be completely adept at politics, being able to talk to people of any party because you know one party mm. will put it in, the next one will cancel it. Yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to have that skill set. I mean, you're almost describing the impossible person. Uh, it I is mean, the impossible they're, they're, person. Yeah, because they're, I, I they're gave almost a, mutually exclusive, aren't they? I gave a talk at uh, University of Warwick some years ago. Um, to th It was the first one that the uh, um, UK Space Agency had actually organised. And I, I gave precisely uh, this point that uh, what is being demanded of the innovative people of the country is an impossible skill set mm. to actually carry their innovations through to fruition. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit like a, uh, uh, a beneficial allele in a gene population trying to survive. You know, it's completely swamped by all the mediocre genes and it, yeah. it gets lost. Um, whereas we've got government sort of extolling the virtue. We want, we want the innovative, you know, we want the paradigm shifts and uh, we want the uh, transformational technology. Well, you better work out some way in which you're going to enable the people that can do that. Yeah. Of course, most of them are nerdy, socially inept people with brilliant ideas, yeah. but no idea how to uh, make it all happen. Yeah, well, you, you see it happening in tech companies, don't you, with, with things like, with something like Apple. You'll have the original engineers that drove it in the first place, but it's the salespeople that are able to sell their own worth. So they're the people that end up running the company. And then, of course, you've lost yeah. because you have, you've yes. no longer got the innovation. So one of the problems is obviously the difficulty of transfer between skill sets um, from the people that have got the idea. And it's not just a question of salespeople. The salespeople have got to be able to understand the vision mm. that uh, the, you know, this particular technologist has got in order to uh, see that carried through into actuality. And this is where my, I mean, I've already said I don't have sleepless nights, but uh, where my anxieties uh, lie with regard to the future of Britain, um, if it is not uh, tied to the uh, European Union. Because fortunately, there are people with uh, innovation over the other side of the channel, uh, with governments that do support and promote it. And to some extent, we get carried along by that. Whereas uh, back in Britain, with uh, what is uh, still prevailing sort of uh, uh, Thatcher sort of um, um, economics and uh, um, what's the word I'm groping for? Market uh, forces? Yeah, Belief in, yeah, all of those sort of things. Yeah. And yet... You know, we live in an age which is dominated by absolute evident market failure. Yeah. And uh, yet we still think that uh, on this, uh, you must have seen Flash Gordon where they're on the tilting table. And uh, <laughs> you know, I, I always feel that we are we are the wrong footed ones on that tilting table. Oh, no. with anything but a level. spike through us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anything but a level playing field. Yeah. Gordon's not alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember the question I was having when you were talking about your uh, rockets. You, you mentioned that you, when you do these, even with Blue Streak and and your and the rockets that you were firing with in your seismic days, was that there was little mysteries that you that, always yeah. that, that do, do you do you really seriously dig out your little notebooks and and sometimes oh, say yeah. to yourself, I'm going to try and is there one mystery that really bugs you? Is there one that that, that you think, oh, what is going on here? Yeah. So Blue Streak um, always burned out a few metres per second slow. And uh, it was Hawker Siddeley Dynamics. Uh, they took over from de Havilland's. And they uh, ran some big number crunching uh, programmes to predict the burnout conditions of Blue Streak. And 
they always finished up with a, a prediction which was higher than the vehicle actually achieved. And so they came to Rolls-Royce and said, look, we've managed to fudge the numbers and it looks as though the specific impulse of the engines is dropping off uh, in flight. So, well, I, I spent hours, we used to use uh, bomb camera fast X film recording of what's happening when you start an engine, how it ignites, how the flow moves and so on. I spent hours till my eyes watered sort of studying what the engine exhaust was doing because the physics is very straightforward. If the specific impulse is dropping off, what, what's happening? Where is the energy going to that's not going into the exhaust yet? I couldn't find it. So I did agree with them that uh, for the F9 flight, they could put this in as long as it was clearly understood this was a mathematical fudge and there was absolutely no physical evidence uh, that the engine was doing that. They flew F9 and it burned out still several metres a second below the predicted velocity. Mm. And I then found out that the Thor Delta did the same and then later found out that uh, the Ariane's 1 through 4 also did the same. Mm. So there is a problem mm. as to why the boosters of rockets do not burn out at the predicted velocity. Now, I've not checked up on recent times with things like SpaceX. I've not got sufficient data and so on. Mm. Uh, but presumably, um, if this is still the case, then SpaceX themselves might be having to empirically accept the fact that the booster is going to burn out slower yeah. than they predict. Now, there's several possibilities. Um, Blue Street used liquid oxygen. And what I found is that I could get a very good fit if I assumed that there was 200 kilograms of liquid oxygen on the vehicle that was not accounted for by the level sensing technology. And Charles Martin, just before he died, I talked to him about that. And whilst he was sceptically thought it wasn't impossible. But there is another intriguing possibility, which I've still got to get around to modelling sometime. We all just think about the Earth and we launch off the Earth and go into orbit around it. But that's not actually what happens, is it? The Earth and the Moon actually rotate about a joint centre, which is about a thousand miles below the surface of the Earth, mm -hmm. which creepily, uh, the Earth has got a velocity about that centre, which is almost exactly the velocity that Blue Street used to burn out slow at. Ooh. So what I need to have a look at is what the dynamics of uh, a rocket launched from the Earth's surface is really like during the early stages um, when it's actually not flying around the uh, uh, centre of the Earth but is actually flying around the joint mass centre of the Earth-Moon system. And I've not got around to doing that bit of modelling yet. But that is a problem that really wow. irks me. So, yeah, no, that, and that sounds like it could be quite complicated. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's not impossible to do it, yeah. uh, but uh, it does require me to have nothing better to do at the time. Wow, well, maybe but, we leave that to Clarence. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it also depends on how the velocity is determined. Uh, it was determined by radar on Blue Streak, um, but an inertial system actually on the vehicle, of course, uh, would pick up a different, uh, because it's affected by the gravitational potential of the Earth-Moon system, mm. would pick up a different uh, answer to that on a piece of radar attached to the surface of the Earth, which has also got part of the orbital velocity around the common uh, Earth-Moon uh, centre of gravity. That makes me think of uh, Pluto, the pluto charon system, because the barycenter there is actually yeah. not in, it, it's somewhere in space between the two yep. bodies. So yep. you can imagine a, a Pluto <coughs> orbiting vehicle. That's going to be a, uh, interesting. So, I mean, clearly uh, vehicles in orbit around the Earth are actually in orbiting in uh, not the gravitational potential of just the Earth. Everybody just does the calculations as though the Moon doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And yet, clearly, there is going mm. to be a... Uh, there, there's a lot of good software now, like GMAT and so on, where you could uh, take account of that. And when I was looking at some missions for uh, a Mars mission, sort of a few years back, had a young mathematician use GMAT to have a look at the influence on uh, particularly highly eccentric orbits. And it, it does make a very significant difference, mostly on timing. Um, but it does also distort orbits, even of satellites orbiting the Earth, of course. Mm. Well, 
the tides are an example of that. You know, mm. the tides are high on the side of the moon and on the side opposite because of the centrifugal acceleration of the Earth orbiting this common centre. Yeah. And uh, we know all about that. We were taught it as kids, but uh, when we come to do our sort of calculations for rockets, we, we tend to shove it onto the uh, uh, sort of I forgot it sort of bit. <laughs> <laughs> Does the, the Coriolis or anything like that start to play into it that, will, into that, yeah. that centre? So Coriolis is a, a product of uh, sort of doing the calculations in a rotating uh, sort of coordinate system, whereas if you just stick to a, a sort of uh, uh, inertial coordinate system and take account of everything else, then the Coriolis doesn't show up. It's a sort of fictive force that mm. is generated by the rotating coordinates. But, uh, it's, it's interesting, but you ask me what's the most irksome problem. I've got other irksome problems, but that's the most irksome one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good one. I'm glad, I'm glad I remembered it. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. The Interplanetary Podcast is alive! The wonderful Alan Bond there, the legend that is... I shall see you all next week. I will probably change the date that the podcast comes out uh, just to make it more feasible. It will probably be Fridays or Saturdays rather than Mondays, but I'll keep you posted. Congratulations to the James Webb team. That all seems to be going awesomely well at the moment. I'll see you soon. Bye!